Morning. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. Monday, June 18th. Uh, nice looking day. Got some good news going into the summer. Got some bad news going into the summer. Uh, always lots to cover. Should be a good show today. I've got Franco Terrazano coming on in about 15 minutes. We're going to talk about the one-year anniversary of the release of the Fair Deal panel report. Uh, a lot of us might have forgotten what that was all about because uh, while it was a big campaign blank and we heard a whole lot about it going in and we had hearings across the province and we took time out of our days to go and attend these meetings, not a heck of a lot's been done about it. Though the equalization referendum is being held this fall, that was one of the recommendations, so give credit where it's due. Um, so I will get on with things. To begin with, though, we should thank those who are subscribing and those who sponsor us uh, we are an independent news outlet. We don't get any government funding. And boy, the way we've been ticking them off, I don't imagine we're going to be getting any anytime soon. Not that we were asking. And uh, so we get sponsors and uh, Resistance Coffee Company is one of them. These guys are really cool. They uh, are a Western Canadian based company. They are, you know, for folks who are tired of having woke political correctness rammed down your throat everywhere you turn. Well, if you're frustrated with that, you know, you, you buy a product somewhere, you buy a pillow, you buy a uh, some towels and you find out that they've been giving money to these crazy woke ca causes on your behalf that you didn't want to contribute to. Well, you don't have to worry about that with a resistance coffee company. They won't give it to those. In fact, they give 10% of every purchase to organizations that are fighting for constitutional freedoms of Canadians. So you can buy a product. It's local. It's well-made, it's high quality, and it's got a lot of witty uh, types of names, you know, liberal tears and, and things like that. Defund the CBC are their types of coffee. Go to resistancecoffee.com. Check them out. They got a variety of coffees, none of that woke crap. And when you buy anything on your first purchase, if you enter Western Standard, all one word, you get 10% off your first order. So 10% goes to a good cause, 10% comes off your bill, and you get some good coffee at home from a company that's uh, supporting good causes, and it's a Western business that you can support, and they're supporting the Western Standard. So remember that, resistancecoffee.com. I've got a bunch coming in soon myself. As well, we have, speaking of rights, the CCFR. This is the uh, Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights. And yes, these are some rights that have certainly been under a lot of attack. You know, the, the Liberals are always trying to come after your property, your firearms, your ability to enjoy them, go out and use them. Well, these guys are fighting for your right to keep carrying on, enjoying your firearms. The Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights, nobody works as hard as they do for your ability to own and use them. You know, not just something stuck up on a wall to admire. Go out and do some target shooting or do some hunting or just do whatever you want safely and not interfering with the rights of others. It seems simple, but it's not. There's people who want to take those rights away, and these guys are fighting for you. Go to firearmsrights.ca, firearmsrights.ca, and you can click on why join us, and they will explain why you should join them and how they're supporting your rights and, uh, you know, how it's important for you. So I, I'm going to start, you know, before uh, <clears throat> there was that big elephant in the room, the article and the retraction from last week. There's not a lot I can add on it. I, honestly, it's not dodging. I, I wasn't um, uh, part of it, so I don't know much more about what happened there aside from what everybody else has read um, and, and the retraction and apology that's come out since. The bottom line, that is a reality. We screwed up. Uh and we have to do better. You know, we've got a really good outlet going on here. We've broken all sorts of great stories. We've had all sorts of great sources. We've covered things that other outlets don't cover or won't cover. And uh, I, I, we overstepped and, and, and messed up uh, the apology and the retractions there. All I can offer is we, we better learn from it and carry on and maintain the, you know, the, the good that we have done because, you know, there's been a whole lot of good come out of the Western standard and there's going to be a whole lot more good coming. Uh, we just can't let that happen again. It was a, a, a misplaced incident. I, you know, again, I can't speak too much directly to it. I, I don't know fully what, what happened there, but it, it certainly wasn't good. And all I can say is uh, I want to make sure we don't do it again. So getting on to other things, there's been a lot of stories to um, uh, speak on though. As I said, uh, we're we're going to be getting an announcement from the provincial government this afternoon from uh, Premier Kenny, and uh, it sounds like that that 70% vaccine uh, threshold has been hit. And again, there's debates on whether it's worthwhile or this or that. The lottery's fair enough. There's all it's a hugely controversial issue in general, 
But it sounds like that threshold for the full reopening has been hit and the clock would start ticking down for two weeks from now to re basically remove all restrictions or the majority of them. I think that's good news. I mean, we can, again, fight over all sorts of other things about whether the lockdowns should have been as severe as they were, which they shouldn't have been, uh, whether there's going to be more lockdowns this fall. Some people are very cynical saying, you know what, we're just going to go right back into it this fall. I sure hope not. I mean, maybe, maybe by this fall, enough people will have seen the evidence because we've seen it that government restrictions really don't have a hell of an impact on the spread of COVID-19. Uh, areas that had heavy duty restrictions sometimes had the highest spreads on earth. Areas that had very light restrictions had very light uh, spread. Sometimes they had light restrictions and they had heavy spread. The bottom line is though, the government can't seem to do a damn thing about it. They try, the, one, you know, the things they are effective are in crushing the economy, crushing individual rights, uh, putting people in jail. They can control people. They just can't control this virus. And we, we, we got to face that. But, you know, that's that that gross vanity of government, the state. They, they, they always feel that they can control everything. I mean, that, that's the reality. I mean, we've got a virus. Thus, the state must be able to fix this. Well, they can't and they haven't. I mean, again, I, I think it's going down. I do believe in vaccinations. I do believe they're working. I believe they're responsible for why it's going down. I know a lot of people don't agree with me on that. Fair enough. Uh, I don't agree with mandatory vaccinations. I never would. Uh you know, an interesting thing, it sounds like the, the fluoridation debate's coming on to a plebiscite this fall, just as a sidetrack. I don't think fluoride's such a bad thing. Good for your teeth, lots of things in the long run. I know there's a lot of people say it's a poison, it's a toxin, and Bill Gates wants to control your mouth or something. Fine. But my issue with it, you know, and if I were to vote in that plebiscite in Calgary, I would vote against it. Because it's not the role of the state to medicate everybody. When you've got a public water supply that people can't avoid then it's, it's not the role of the city to put that in your water, even if it is good. It's not their job. Uh, if you want fluoride for your children's teeth, if you want it for your own teeth, you can get fluoridated products at any grocery store, pharmacy, and so on, and apply them yourself. It's not the role of the government to do it. And uh, uh, that applies to vaccines as well. I, I agree with them, but again, I would fight tooth and nail before it was actually made Mandatory, absolutely not. You cannot do that. Now, people talk about coercion and, and vaccine passports. Those are areas of debate and they're worth going into and examining as well. But for the time being, I got vaccinated. I haven't grown a, a third testicle or anything unusual since. Uh, I haven't turned into one of the lizard people and 5G waves are not controlling my mind or speech yet. But I'm certain everybody will keep an eye on me in case that should occur. Either way, things are looking good on that front. You know, we're going to reopen, hopefully get some, some normal, normalcy going this summer. On the other end, the federal government just announced the borders are going to remain uh, restricted and closed for another month, you know. So I, I, it's up and down. It's, it's hard to maintain optimism about things. Uh, infections are, are way down on the Canadian side. They're down on the American side. They're not out of control yet they are terrified of opening the borders. You know, Canada has been a leaky sieve when it comes to uncontrolled flights coming from China, coming from India, from all these infection hotspots in the past. They wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. I mean, they came up with quarantine regulations and uh, testing and all sorts of things, but they didn't stop it. But when it comes to somebody who just wants to drive south of the American border for, you know, whatever the hell they want for a weekend, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Infections are done, but we're still going to stop that. It's destroying businesses on the border. It's uh, making our lives that much more miserable as, as we uh, move on into things. And uh, who knows if and when they're ever going to open that damn border again. Uh, you know, and the fear campaign continues. We're certainly still seeing it. I, I, the, the big thing, of course, now is the variants. And, and that's uh, the item of conversation out there. So two people at the Foothills Hospital, and there's been an outbreak of this, this latest Delta variant, apparently. Uh, two people died, and then it's headline, 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 because they want to focus on fear, focus on fear. Don't focus on infections going down. Don't focus on the economy opening up. Don't focus on anything positive. Let's keep everybody scared. Well, let's go into the details. The people who died in the Foothills Hospital from that variant were already in the hospital dying. They are in their 80s with a number of comorbidities. At best... The variant sped their demise by a couple of days. And it's something else was going to get them, whether it was a door slamming, uh, 
or, or you know, we all die eventually. We got to get a little realistic about the risk of what this virus presents. And we have it in headlines to make it sound, oh my God, this variant's killing everybody and it gets the immune. No, it, 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 it took away two people who unfortunately were already at the end of their days. Nothing was going to save them. No more lockdowns were going to save them. No American border crossings were going to save them. No cancellation of restaurants or stampede events or rodeos or chuck wagon races. We're going to save those two unfortunate 80-something-year-old souls who passed and happened to have that variant while they're at it. But that doesn't stop the mainstream media from headlining everything. Two people died of the variant. Two people died of the variant. Everybody be scared. Remain curled up in your house in fear. And uh, let's carry on. We've got to change the narrative. We got to get a little more positive. There are positive things coming out, and we got to talk about. It. I'm not talking about burying our heads in the sand about real risks and real problems and real threats, but man, I just get sick of watching the mainstream media always report the most negative aspect of the thing that they can. I mean, we we, we saw that in the past. Whatever the stats are, you know, there's all sorts of measures of the pandemic, whether it's R values or number of infections or number of deaths or number of ICU beds. The media will lead with whatever one is scariest. You know, when the infections were going wild, yet the deaths weren't that high, you never heard them talk about the deaths. All they talked about was the infections. Now that the infections are going through the toilet, they're talking about every death as if it's the first death that ever happened. We're getting sick of it. You know, sometimes just put one out and say, hey, damn it, things are actually looking pretty good. It would be really refreshing. It really would. And on a lot of fronts, they are looking good. So I'm going to celebrate that and look forward to it. And uh, hopefully some of the folks in the, the rest of the media will start taking on that attitude. Because if we're constantly reporting on the most negative and scary things we can, well, of course, the population is going to remain, remain negative and scared. Okay, enough of my ranting. I'm going to bring Franco Terrazano in from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. He's the national director of them. I think he's still in the West for now, but he's going to be uh, exiled to Ottawa and uh, doing his role over there. How are you doing, Ter uh, Franco? Hey, I'm doing well, Corey. Can you hear me okay? Um, I just got a new computer, so just testing this live stream for the first time today. Well, you're coming in just fine there. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, and yeah, cool. I'm doing well, man. I'm, I'm heading to Ottawa in about a month here, so still in Calgary, um, and definitely enjoying the, the nice weather today, hey? Yeah. No, as I said, I'm trying to go into things with a little bit of optimism anyways. Look at the bright side of some things, you know, not delusionally, but hey, it's a nice day. Get out and enjoy it. Well, after listening to us. This is more important right now. So it is the, uh, well, yesterday was the one year anniversary of the release of the Fair Deal panel report. Um, there's quite a bit in there and uh, quite a bit to unpack. What I've kind of seen though is not a heck of a lot's happened since it was released. Uh, where are you sitting on this, Franco? Yeah, I mean, the report was uh, was was jam packed with a whole bunch of things where where Alberta can try to push the feds to get a fair deal, and I think most Albertans, that's probably one of the huge issues policy wise right now. Hayes trying to get a fair deal within within Canada. I think it's pretty clear to to, to most of us Alberta taxpayers is that we've been treated like a cash cow, uh, not just during this downturn that Alberta's been going through for the last five plus years, but for for decades, right? Um, I mean, we've seen the numbers since the 1960s. Alberta taxpayers have paid more than $600 billion more to the feds and, and by extension the other provinces than we've received back in federal spending. But of course, we still have politicians in other provinces, BC, Quebec, and of course, federal politicians that continue to roadblock our development. And Corey, when we're talking about the Fair Deal panel report and its recommendations, um, there hasn't been much movement on too many of the, the different items. But I would say that probably the most important one, that equalization referendum, we're finally starting to see the Kenny government get the ball rolling on that. We saw the um, the question for the referendum announced within the legislature, and it looks like, hey, bring on that referendum come October 18th. Uh, yeah, I mean, in that sense of giving one um, positive out there out of all of this, they did follow through on that. We do have that referendum coming. Uh, I see that the tall foreheads of the usual suspects are all poo-pooing it and ignoring it. Uh, Ned Nenshi has even been out outright mocking it. Uh, they're trying their very hardest to, to avoid uh, going into this uh, a political exercise to actually speak to Albertans. But a lot of people say it's futility, it's a waste of time, it's beating our heads on the wall. Why would this referendum be a good thing, Ter uh, Franco? Well, I completely disagree with with what they're saying, right? And and look, we we have been getting a raw deal in Canada, right? Albert, us Albertans. I talked about that six hundred billion dollar net transfer out of the province from us taxpayers, but. 
equalization is really a key part of that fiscal drain, right? It costs us about $3 billion every single year. That's Alberta taxpayers paying into the federal program, not getting a single dime back. Um, and that's a cost of about $600 per person every single year. And it's more than just the direct cost, right? Because through equalization, there's just these really negative incentives that are created through this program, where you have politicians in, in provinces that receive equalization like Quebec, who can rely more on tax dollars from coming outside of their province rather than actually putting in good policies and trying to grow their economies, right? So that naturally um, encourages or at least reduces um, the ability for Quebec to, it actually, it encourages these uh, politicians to to, to put in bad policies, to not grow their resources. And of course, Albertans are dinged that way as well. So it's kind of the double whammy when it comes to policies like equalization, right? Where it hurts us as taxpayers, but it also hurts us when we try to grow our economy by giving politicians the incentive to put in bad policies. Yeah, well, in, in an area that gets difficult with it, but I mean, a lot of provinces are dependent on that influx of equalization. And and again, I mean, I know a lot of the discussions that come out from uh, others, they say, well, even if you got rid of equalization, the, the government's going to transfer to those provinces uh, disproportionately. That's just what they do. It all goes into one pot and it goes out. But I, I believe, I mean, it would give another, they'd have to justify it a little more then. It's not just this thing of making everybody equal. They're gonna have to explain to us why you're transferring more to this region as opposed to the other. And I mean, if it was supposed to be a hand up to help a province get on its feet, well, it's been a catastrophic failure. Quebec's been dependent since the beginning of this program, and they're still as dependent as they ever have. So, I mean, at what point do you say maybe it didn't work? Yeah, that's a really good point, right? Because equalization has been in here since, what, 1957? Like, how many decades worth of equalization do we need to kind of uh, keep having here to finally get these provinces um, on their own? And, and really, the solution to all this is, is to force these provinces to actually put in good policies that encourage their economic development. Um, there's so much to unpack there, Corey, but I think one thing we have to remember here is that Alberta did just stumble onto our wealth, right? A, a large portion of the reason that Alberta's economies flourished is because we had good policies, right? For, for remember, remember the 90s with, with Ralph Klein, for example, where he reigned in spending, um, pushed to lower taxes. We're seeing Premier Kenny lowering business taxes right now. All of that adds on, right? So you, you can look across the world, also within Canada, where you have uh, countries, provinces, jurisdictions that have natural resources, but it doesn't mean their economies are going to be flourishing if you have bad policies, if you have governments roadblocking development. And, um, you, you know, Corey, this isn't just Albertans who are recognizing these negative incentives through equalization. You also have politicians, Francois Legault, the premier in Quebec, he himself has recognized the need to rely less on equalization and rely more on growing Quebec's economy. You have Premier Higgs out in New Brunswick. He himself has recognized the negative incentives of equalization when you directly subsidize these politicians with other provinces tax dollars, right? Tax dollars from other provincial taxpayers. And, and, and you know what? Right now, when you look at the federal debt problem, where we're more than a trillion dollars in debt federally, the federal government is going to have to find savings sometime, somewhere. And, and a good place to find those savings is in that $20 billion equalization program. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, what, will they ever get the will to, I guess, you know, but I mean, it, it's, uh, it's funny. And it's one of the areas that the, the people opposing this, this um, referendum constantly point out is that Albertans don't understand what ref equalization is. They, they don't, you know, they can't grasp the big concept. You know, even if I grant that we don't understand it, then we're a bunch of fools. It's beyond our ability to comprehend and grasp and vote re responsibly on this. Well, what better way to get everybody to understand? I mean, come on, guys, what are you afraid of? There's a municipal election happening anyway. It's not costing us a whole pile. I mean, I know if it cost a whole pile of money, you'd be screaming at the, the top of the rooftops because that's what you guys are opposed to is excess uh, government spending. And uh, there, here's your chance. You can tell us all how foolish we are. We can put this equalization chafing to bed. Albertans will vote, you know, 10% uh, yes in this referendum to get rid of equalization and, and uh, we'll never talk about it again. So, I mean, why would they be opposed to having such an open uh, discussion on this? Well, Corey, the reason is because Albertans do fundamentally understand the problems with equalization and the problems with the current uh, federal transfer system, right? Like, sure, many Albertans might not understand the minute details of the equalization formula per se, but we understand when we're getting a raw deal, right? We understand when we, through a federal program, we pay taxes into that program, we don't get a single cent back 
from that program. But yet we still have um, other politicians in other provinces that want to roadblock our development. We still have the federal government that has its boot on our neck. So yes, I think Albertans do fundamentally understand the issues with equalization. Uh, most importantly, we understand the most important issues. Um, now, here's the thing. When it, when it comes to cost, you know, all of a sudden we have this equalization referendum and, and we see people talking about wasteful government spending. And, and you know, I love when people are talking about wasteful government spending. I wish they talked about it more or they cared about it more. But here's the truth of the matter. We're having an equalization referendum with municipal elections. Corey, how much money do you think it costs to add another question on a ballot? <laughs> right? Come on here. And if you really think that that is a waste of money, wait till you find out how much money equalization has been costing Alberta taxpayers, about $3 billion per year. Um, that was an estimate from former finance minister Ted Morton, $3 billion bucks in 2018, $600 per person. Now that's a big waste of money if you ask me, especially when we're sub directly subsidizing politicians in other provinces that want to roadblock our development. Um, so, so really, you have to give Premier Kenny kudos here. It was, a, it was a very smart decision to add the equalization referendum with the municipal elections because it does reduce the cost to taxpayers. And if it costs all this money to add one more question onto a municipal ballot, I think our problem is with uh, these bureaucrats who, who, who just seem to waste money left, right, and center. Yeah, well, the whole bottom line is it's direct democracy. I mean, it, there's a model I love and I talk about it all the time is in Switzerland where they, they do a great deal of governance on a local level based on, on referendums. And it's not like they hold one every week for every different uh, issue as it pops up. It, uh, you know, every once in a while, there'll be a, a whole bunch of ballot choices and everybody will come out and take part on, on which ones they're, they're going to vote on. Um, and that's another frustration. And I get a bit annoyed, you know, uh, again, the mayor of Calgary talks about how, oh, there's going to be so many questions on this ballot. It's going to confuse voters and everything. Again, that assumption of how stupid voters are kind of chafes on me. And I, I get a little tired of that. We can walk and chew gum, you know, we can pick our local councillor, our local mayor, and actually make our minds up on a couple of issues while we're at it. It's not that hard, I don't think. Yeah, it's really an insult, isn't it? I mean, speaking of the Switzerland model, uh, how great is this? But uh, I believe it was last week, the Swiss just voted against a proposal for a national carbon tax. Hey, don't you wish we could have that referendum uh, here in Canada? Um, of course, I mean, who's surprised that uh, Mayor Nenshi's a little bit upset about this? I mean, he's probably still upset about that Calgary Olympics referendum that we had a few years back where the people uh, voted no to that to that boondoggle thankfully we did now there's one more thing i'd like to add uh, to this whole referendum right will an equalization referendum is it alberta silver bullet no it's not it's not but it is the fundal fundamental step for our fight for fairness right and if not an equalization referendum well then what Either, either you think that Alberta is getting a fair deal within Canada, which I think it's pretty clear that we're not, right? More than $600 billion uh, paid to Ottawa, more than that we've gone back since the 1960s, still have economic damaging policies coming from Ottawa. So I think it's pretty clear that we're not getting a fair deal from Ottawa. So if not the equalization referendum, then what? Um, now, I think Ted Morton has made the case that uh, a, a clear majority on a clear uh, constitutional question will push the feds and the provinces to the negotiating table table or it, the fair deal panel also made that point right that it would morally obligate the province and the feds to negotiate but perhaps just as important as that is is i often hear many albertans say well look the people in the rest of canada just don't understand the hardships that we're going through well, what better way to put a spotlight on our legitimate grievances and, and get that spotlight coast to coast than, than to have a province-wide referendum on equalization? Well, absolutely. And I mean, you know, it's just a, as another side note that maybe an unintended consequence of having extra questions on the ballot, but it'll pull people out. You know, I mean, one of the things people have always decried is low voter turnouts, particularly in municipal elections. Well, I mean, I, I know people should consider it their civic duty and they'll come out no matter what if, they, if there's a vote that's important. But realistically, maybe somebody who's been indifferent to civic elections all the time is actually going to get up because they are quite worked up over the equalization. And, you know, they're, they're not going to come in and just vote on the one. Chances are they're going to take their time and vote on everything else, which is better for democracy as a whole, in my view. The more interest you can give people to participate, uh, the better. I mean, we will get out. And as you said, though, uh, part of the problem, I think, with some of the people in government is that, well, those darned unwashed might vote the way they don't like, as we saw with the Olympics 
And to give credit to a politician we rarely give credit to, it was Rachel Notley who put the brakes on and said, hey, we're not committing to this thing unless uh, uh, people get out and, and vote and accept it. And uh, they didn't. And, it, and it, you know, what a great example uh, to keep doing these things. Well, Corey, um, within the whole Fair Deal initiative, right, when, when Kenny announced the, the Fair Deal initiative um, before the panel brought back its report, one of the things that Kenny simultaneously announced was Citizens Initiative, right, which is the power for us to actually put forward referendum on important issues. Um, now, I think you do have to strike the right balance, right? You, do, you don't need referendums every other day. Uh, so you do need to strike the, ref, uh, the right balance. But the thing is, is that we... we I think Albertans and, and citizens across Canada, I mean, we are supposed to be the boss when it comes to the democratic process, right? Politicians, yes, we elect them to represent them, to represent us, but at the end of the day, we, we do need more checks and balances either to punish mis misbehaving politicians or to repeal legislation that goes directly against our wishes, right? So I think you do have to give credit to uh, Premier Kenny for implementing Citizens Initiative. Um, can we arm wrestle over the thresholds and things like that? Absolutely. But I think this is a huge win uh, for government accountability here in Alberta. Now, let me just give you a concrete example of, of where I think referendums would have made a huge issue in Alberta. Well, we, we just gave credit to uh, former Premier Notley. She deserved credit on the Olympics. But one place she doesn't deserve any credit for was when she imposed a provincial carbon tax without running on that in her election platform. And that would have been a great example of where referendums could have been useful for the people of Alberta. I have no doubt in my mind that if we did have citizens initiative, we would have canceled uh, the NDP carbon tax and saved up taxpayers a bunch of money in the meantime. Yeah, well, I'm going to pivot a, a little bit here. Uh, then into more of the Fair Deal panel report because it talked about a uh, formation of an Alberta pension plan. And one of the things it said as it, in the report though was that's the sort of thing that will have to go to a referendum or they feel it should, uh, but we should get rolling on getting that together and, and building it. And we, we haven't seen any movement on that. If you could, uh, I, I've got a, a technical issue here. I'm going to step out for one minute and it's an easy uh, issue for to queue you up on. I'll be right back. But if you could explain a bit the, the concept of the Alberta pension plan and, and where that's going from the Fair Deal panel report. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess we're, let, let me just start with where we are right now when it comes to uh, the questions over the Alberta pension plan. So right now, it seems like the government is studying it, uh, taking a study, looking at the pros and cons of it. And they said that if they do move forward with it, the next step would go to a referendum. We were expecting, I think, the results of the study uh, this spring, but we're still kind of waiting to see what happens next. Now, I, I think from the economic standpoint, uh, the Alberta pension plan, at least from what I've read, seems to make sense. We, we saw some analysis from the Fraser Institute that shows like many other of these federal programs, we have actually spent uh, billions of dollars putting into the program that we've received back in the last decade or so. So from an economic standpoint, it, it seems to make sense that pulling out of the um, Canada pension plan and starting an Alberta pension plan um, would be the right thing to do. Um, but one thing that I'll kind of add into this discussion is that if we are going to be pulling out of the Alberta pension plan, Corey, so I was just going over um, yes. the economic benefits of an Alberta pension plan. Now, one thing that I'd like to bring up, Corey, and maybe we can have a little back and forth on this one, is that, look, if we're going to pull out of the Alberta pension plan, which or the Canada pension plan, which essentially is a Ponzi scheme where you pay for someone else's golden years, if we're going to pull out of the CPP, I don't think that we should just replicate the Ponzi plan here in Alberta. I think we can definitely improve upon it right and there's two ways we can do that first um we let's just get the government out of the game of people's retirement savings let people keep more of their own income let people decide how they want to allocate their money for the retirement but if you're going to have the government get into people's uh retirement then at least let let's set up something like individual retirement accounts which is happening similar to australia where people are able to actually decide where their investments are going to and actually have ownership over their own um, savings, which is not the case when it comes to the Canada pension plan. Yeah, no, I mean, if we're going to pull out a one, there's no sense giving another carbon copy of the last one we just left only in a smaller version. I, I, I like that very much um, as well, unfortunately, and we've seen it, uh, governments, if they get their hands on large funds and large chunks of money can sometimes utilize that capital for political ends uh, such as, uh, oh, investing in a pipeline to the United States or something like that. 
and then the money ends up uh, being lost. Uh, maybe leave that to people to direct their own retirement funds and, and uh, put it into something a little more blue chip. Well, and, and Corey, too, when, when we're talking about these type of uh, collective government pension plans, I mean, essentially, you have to rely. So what, what is essentially going on is, is as a younger worker, you're really not saving for your own retirement through these government plans. You, you're really, for the most part, saving for other people's retirements. And then you have to hope that when you reach retirement age, you have to hope on the goodwill of politicians that they'll actually continue this plan. And you also have to hope in, in, in the health of the government's finances, because Look, I mean, our government finances right now are a complete disaster, right? Federally, provincially, and um, our politicians eventually going to have to start scaling back across the board. I think they are. So not only do you have to rely on other people to fund your retirement at that age, but you also have to rely on the good faith of politicians, but also on the fact that our, our finances, government-wise, are not going to be in the ditches. So, so better yet, just let people keep more of their own money, tax people less, let people direct how they want to actually use their money today and money tomorrow. And if we are going to have a government system, let's follow something similar to what is going on in Australia, where you actually have individual retirement savings accounts. That's your own money. And that's your own money for your own golden years. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, let's let's look at opportunities to create something new. I mean, the old plan was adequate perhaps, but it definitely needs a lot of reform. And I mean, if we're going to create a new one, but then again, has there been I haven't seen any sign of any serious discussion since the panel closed up and made that recommendation, though I, I haven't heard of any uh, uh, pension experts starting to model the new plan that they would put forth to Albertans in a referendum or anything of this sort. Is there any action on this at all, or did they just recommend it and forget yeah. about it? Well, Corey, the last that I've heard, so there hasn't been too much attention on this, but the last report that I heard is that the government is studying this. Um, I remember seeing something that we were expecting something in the spring, summer, right, from the government, and then the government would then decide whether or not we're going to have a referendum vote on it. But but so far, I haven't seen the government's full analysis on it. And I think just like all the, uh, the rest of us, I think we're all eagerly awaiting that. Yeah, well, death by committee or, or you know, withering on the vine and, and it gets tiresome. I know we've been in an unprecedented 16 months here, uh, but realistically, you know, if all the people are working from home and, and locked in and cloistered, it would have been a great time actually to bury your nose in some books and uh, uh, work together through Zoom meetings. I mean, this business of government didn't have to stop uh, because of the pandemic. So I, I don't see that as a valid excuse. And I know a lot of the language in the Fair Deal panel report when they released it uh, a year ago yesterday, uh, was immediate. That word was in it. Immediately get on this. Uh, so now that we're sitting 12 months later and, and we're not seeing any, any progress on anything aside from the, the referendum, uh, I think they missed that word in the report. Well, Corey, and you know why it's so, why it was so eager to have it become so immediate? And I was at a few different uh, fair deal panel events, right? So I definitely had the opportunity to hear many Albertans speak on this issue. And why it was so important for, for immediate action is because we are going through a downturn over the last 12 months. We are, but it didn't start 12 months ago during COVID-19. This downturn has been on since the end of 2014, where Alberta has just been devastated. Yes, some of the factors are macroeconomic outside of Canada's control, but let's be honest here and let's call it a spade a spade. A lot of the issues that made Canada or Alberta's tough times tougher the last five plus years is directly related to politicians in other provinces. Remember British Columbia? Remember the NDP and Greens uh, agreeing to employ every tool available to stop a pipeline coming from Alberta? Remember that? Remember Quebec's Premier Francois Legault talking about our oil as dirty energy, saying there is no social acceptability for another pipeline, oil pipeline from Alberta? Well, what about the feds, right? The feds rejected Northern Gateway Pipeline. The feds moved the energy or the goalposts on the Energy East pipeline. The feds put in a no more pipelines law. The feds put in a discriminatory tanker ban. Now we're seeing that the feds, they, they have a carbon tax. They're talking about a second carbon tax through fuel regulation. So it's been one blow after another for Alberta. And it, this isn't a recent thing. This has been going on for years now. And I think that's why the sense of urgency was discussed by the Fair Deal panel. And, and, and it was evidently clear when you were at those events that Albertans knew that the time for action was probably a few years ago, but definitely now. Yeah, well, better late than never. I mean, even if we should have started earlier, it doesn't mean we can't start today. Uh, and those panels, I mean, that was, in my view, the talking period. And now we're still talk not even talking on some of them. I mean, it, it, that's been a, a frustration. So I appreciate you guys bringing that up. You know, we got to remind them, hey, guys, 
you know, speaking of spending money on exercise, that panel cost a heck of a lot more than adding that extra question on a referendum ballot. You know, that, that was costly to go around the province and, and let everybody speak and uh, kept people happy. I mean, uh, so another recommendation it talked about uh, pursuing more free trade between provinces. I mean, that's a huge issue in Canada. It always has been. And Shelley Carrington, uh, one of the commenters, said, what, what we, we do understand, we don't understand why our energy resources are constantly blocked by some of our provinces. Like, you know, it's one thing to have the feds block us, as infuriating as it is, but that's they do have it within their ability. But it's the cowering to the provincial governments that try to shut us down, when it's Quebec saying they're going to shut us down, when it's BC saying they're going to shut us down. Uh, but I haven't seen much evidence of the Kenny government taking a stronger stance with our neighboring provinces on these kinds of issues yet either. Well, I do think that the Kenny government has made some, some significant movements on reducing our own internal trade barriers. And I think that's important, right? Because when we're talking about trade barriers, it, it doesn't just hurt us when other provinces have barriers to trade. We actually hurt ourselves when we put our own internal barriers to trade, because at the end of the day, who pays for these types of trade barriers, whether they're tariff or, or non-tariff, it's the consumers, right? It's, it's the economy um, also where those trade barriers are. So I think the Kenny government has made some steps in terms of reducing internal trade barriers. I would say, however, though, is that you, when you talk about the equalization referendum, you have to understand and think about it, not within a vac or not by itself, but in the context of how it encourages or discourages resource development. I mean, Quebec has been ob the obvious example of the province that has roadblock our development in terms of pipelines and, and oil and gas movement, things like that. But remember, it's, it's the incentives, the perverse incentives created through a program like equalization that in part allows uh, politicians in Quebec to get away with it, right? Um, with Without these types of equalization programs, or at least if it was a smaller program, you would have to see these Quebec politicians putting in policies to actually grow their own resources, right? Because that would be how they would have to fund their government services. But instead, when you have a program like equalization that seems to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, it's at about $20 billion this year. Well, that allows these politicians to rely less on growing and developing their own resources and more on the tax dollars coming from taxpayers in other provinces. So I would say that the equalization referendum is in an indirect way, a push for freer movement within Canada of our resources. Yeah, well, that's a good roundabout way of it. I mean, the thing is, if you want to get voter support, you want to get people support on the ground. I mean, the, the common question everybody asks, if, if not outright, is what's in it for me? And I think perhaps a, a lot of your average Quebec citizens don't understand that having a pipeline, perhaps say go to the East Coast, even if it doesn't feel like it, there's a lot in it for them. Your social programs, your spending is coming from what goes into that pipe and gets sold to, to outside buyers. And, and we need that discussion over there as well as over here. Uh, but it, it opens a, a bigger can of worms. I understand diplomacy is critical. I mean, you don't want a premier just going in fist swinging and, and fighting with our provincial neighbors, uh, you know, indiscriminately. It's just going to make things worse. But at the same time, people start asking themselves, what's the point of confederation? I mean, the real role is that we should have absolute free trade of our products and our free movement of our people and our goods. If not, then we might as well be independent countries because, uh, you know, these provinces can shut us down. Well, Corey, let's just move back to another important thing about the equalization referendum, right? You just mentioned right there that it's important to have this national discussion. Well, that's that's what this equalization referendum in part's going to do is, is put the discussion of resource movement and resource development on the national table, so to speak, right? Because at the end of the day, I mean, oil and gas, demand for oil and gas uh, really isn't going anywhere substantially anytime soon, right? So if Quebec is not going to get their oil, let's say, through pipeline or more oil through pipelines from Alberta, well, then how are they going to get it? Are they going to get those resources from other countries? Are they going to get those resources from other means of transportation? I mean, we've all seen the meme um, or the graphic of the oil or of the tanker, right, filling up in Vancouver and, and going all the way to Quebec or, sorry, to our East Coast. We've all seen that meme, right? And it highlights the point is that, well, pipelines tend to be a very efficient way to move our resources. And if you're not moving your resources uh, through pipelines, well, then how are you going to do it? Are you going to move it more through tankers? That doesn't sound too environmentally friendly, especially if you can just go pipeline from Alberta to the East Coast. Or are you going to move it through uh, rail? 
which obviously has issues there that, that many Canadians are aware of. And of course, it's the separate piece too, is if you're not going to get resources from Alberta, well, then what countries are you going to get those resources from? Because you can't just snap your fingers and not rely on the resources that Alberta is producing. And of course, I know this is a bit of a long-winded answer, Corey, but as a taxpayers federation, we have shown that not only do, does pipelines help grow our economy, get people back to work, but because of the pipeline deficit in Canada, uh, we're losing out on billions and billions of dollars in government revenue that we desperately need to pay for different types of services. Yeah, and again, we understand that. We just need to, some more folks in those other nine provinces perhaps to get on. And, and the equalization, uh, hopefully the coverage is a bit balanced as we go into it as the vote goes with that because it will make national news but if it's constantly panels and experts talking about how it's just a few whining redneck albertans it, it, it probably won't uh, make much impact on the thinking of people in other provinces uh, i mean you're going to see a lot of that when you head to ottawa there um well, one, one of the things that, that, that could be my that could be a task for a person like me i guess hey when 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 i make my way to ottawa hey corey do you mind if we chat chat about one very important issue that i think has been um under discussed when we're talking about the fair deal panel i want to talk about tax points tax mm -hmm. points was actually a policy that the ucp ran on within their platform and essentially what tax points does it's a great accountability tool a great autonomy tool is that it it, it would push to re reduce our reliance on transfers from the federal government for for programs like healthcare. it would reduce our federal tax burden and instead um, allow the alberta government to raise that revenue if it's if it wants to and allow Alberta to kind of implement uh, a made in Alberta healthcare delivery, so to speak, right? So a tax point is a should be a huge part of this autonomy discussion, but it's one thing that um, we, we, we haven't heard too much about, and it's important to, to raise that the UCP actually ran on this within their platform, but we haven't heard too much from the, the Kenny government on tax points. Maybe it's because they're dealing obviously with a bunch of other different issues right now, but it's something that I think if we're pushing for autonomy, pushing for government accountability, that's something that we need here in Alberta. Well, yeah, no, that's, that's another aspect of course. And, and it's, again, it's, it's bringing to mind the people where those dollars are going, where they're coming from. Uh, as I said, you know, something with, with Toronto and Ontario, the frustration, Albertans get mad at them and it sometimes feel that, you know, these guys don't like us. Actually, what's even worse, no, actually, they don't think about us at all, typically. They're pretty much indifferent to us. And, and uh, that's kind of in some ways even more infuriating. But the bottom line is we've got to reach out and get on to mind with them, not just with screaming and shouting, but you know, perhaps just a, a discourse. And, and I think uh, the, the sequelization discussion might lead a bit to that. But I'll move a little further on now into another area. It's not so much taxpayer related, but it can be to a degree in inefficiencies because it's part of the Fair Deal panel report, was moving away from the RCMP contracts. And I know this is a sticky one with a lot of people. I mean, but on the same vein of when we're talking about changing the pension plan, you know, we've got things that have a lot of challenges. The RCMP, I mean, there's a fantastic officers. They're a very, uh, you know, long standing traditional force. Uh, but of course, there's some very serious questions about some of their actions. Uh, and now that, you know, with BLM things happening in the last year and, and residential school talk and, and histories with, with uh, uh, First Nations, uh, you know, we could have an opportunity to create a police force that is more modernized and, and be able to be more uh, receptive to, to uh, local needs and things if we moved away from the RCMP contract. But I, I haven't seen much talk on that part of the Fair Deal panel report yet either. Yeah, Corey, I think with this one, uh, it's really going to be devils in the details, especially when it comes from the taxpayer perspective, right? Um, so I think it's going to be very important for the government just to be completely open and honest with Albertans in terms of how much this is actually going to cost. I think that is just going to be so key, right? And I think if um, if it's going to cost less than what we're already paying, then I think it's a no-brainer. I think it's also a no-brainer if we can do it for the same amount of money. Um, but I think what, when it comes to all of these fair deal panel recommendations, we do have to understand that none of it gives the Kenny government a blank check to drive us further and further into debt. I mean, provincial government debt is, is already about, is already a hundred billion dollars. It's moving towards $116 billion by the end of the fiscal year, which was almost unimaginable, you know, just a few years back us to be in this amount of, of red ink. So I think what is going to be so key is for the government just to be open and honest with Albertans on, on what that would mean and, and what it's going to cost. 
Yeah, because it wouldn't be a minor change and there's long-term contracts. But again, if it was a, a recommendation of the panel, we should work on with it. Uh, another area, you know, the last I heard about it was in April and that's one of the areas that they keep saying they're gonna do, saying they're gonna do, but I haven't seen it yet, is the appointment of a provincial firearms officer uh, that gets into property rights perhaps and things like that. Or I mean, is it could that be helpful or is that another layer of bureaucracy? And uh, do you, again, do you think they're ever gonna actually move on it? No, I think that would be a good move. Uh, I think so, at least in terms of uh, accountability and stuff like that. I think it's one of the more uh, minor issues that uh, we've been talking about within this fair deal panel uh, discussion. I'm not exactly sure where the ball is exactly on this point, but I think it fits into this whole thing. Um, you know, from the taxpayer perspective and Alberta taxpayer perspective, when we talk about the fair deal, it means a, a lot of different things, right? But I think fundamentally it talks about a relationship with Ottawa and the rest of provinces when it comes to our ability to grow our economy and how much of the bill that we're actually footing here. And, and so I think the, the bigger issues really are the equalization and the equalization referendum. There is no fair deal for Albertans without tackling and addressing this unfair federal scheme. So it's good to see the government getting the ball rolling there. Um, of course, we, we talked about the pension plan. Um, that is another one of these big issues, but I'll bring it back to just the tax points. I think that is probably the top three of the big issues here when it comes to a fair deal for Alberta taxpayers. Um, and that is something that I think we need to discuss more and need to push this Kenny government to take concrete steps on. Again, they ran on it in their platform. So I think uh, we expect some movement here. Uh, that's great. Yeah, and the main thing is just, to, again, just getting it rolling. And it ties into that theme of, okay, we've got one and we're celebrating it, the equalization referendum. We got a summer to work on this, uh, a fall to get into the voting. I, I suspect we might be into a federal election this fall. There's, there's, people are gonna, people who like politics are gonna get a, a heavy dose of it, and the people who hate politics are, are gonna be uh, nauseated this fall. But we got a lot to pay attention to and a lot of balls to juggle. But it's all very, very important. Are there other aspects of the Fair Deal panel we haven't covered that you'd like to speak on here? You know, Corey, I think we I think we really hit it on all and, I, and I'll just kind of go back to the, the I think the few major issues uh, as I see it is, is, of course, the cost, right? More than six hundred billion dollars is is what Alberta taxpayers have paid to to Ottawa. And of course, the rest of the province is than what we have gotten back in spending since the 1960s. And I think where that really frustrates people is the fact that even though we have these huge contributions to the rest of Canada, we still have politicians all across the country who are roadblocking our development. And I think that is what really needs to change. And, and that's why the equalization referendum, I think is our, 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 best bet, uh, our best bet to really enter the game, right? The way I see it is, is right now, it seems like we're screaming, we're on the field, but we're screaming from the sidelines. And it's the equalization referendum that puts us into the fight. And, and along those lines, Corey, I just want to, to put in a shameless plug here is that the CTF, we did launch um, an equalization referendum campaign. Uh, please, 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 let's get all hands on deck here because we really do need to show a clear majority. We need to send Trudeau a message on what we think about the status quo. And you can find the, um, the CTFs, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation's campaign website at fightequalization.ca. All right on. And, and that's the main message we got to get out. Even if it feels futile to people, if it feels like it's an endeavor, it isn't. It's worthwhile getting out there. Even if you're beating your head on that wall, it's bringing the discussion forward. And if it does fail, well, then it's time to open up other discussions. But right now there's a mechanism. It's here. Let's use it. Let's make, you know, get our voices out there. So uh, I appreciate the taxpayers. Federation taking that on to help, you know, remind people throughout the, the summer and into fall and as this campaign unfolds that it is important and it uh, can move towards some things. So where can we find uh, more information where you're up to, what you're up to and where, what you're going to be up to now that you're moving off to the evil east there? <laughs> well, look, I'm, I'm actually uh, pretty excited to go to Ottawa. I mean, hopefully I'll be able to catch a Blue Jays game in person uh, sooner rather than later. That would be fantastic. It's only a, a short little drive to Toronto. So fingers crossed there. Um, but please check us out at taxpayer.com. Check out the newsroom. Um, but more importantly for this discussion, please, especially if you're in Alberta, head over to fightequalization.ca and and uh, let's, let's give us a hand and let's make sure that we send a, a clear message to Trudeau about the status quo. Right on. And, uh, yeah, you'll have plenty uh, to fight for on our behalf. We're over in Ottawa as well. You don't have to be here to do it. In fact, that's where the, the bigger ogre is. So I look forward to seeing what you're up to over there. And I'm certain we'll be talking again uh, sometime soon. Awesome. Hey, Corey, thank you so much for having me on today. All right. I'll talk later. Right so, yeah, you know, and, and we just haven't been hearing about that fair deal panel. Uh, so some folks, I think, uh, you know, uh, 
see it as a bit of a bait and switch exercise. Let's keep the regionalists uh, happy. Let's let them talk. Let's let them vent, and then we we won't do much with it. And I think there's some truth to that strategy. Uh, but as as Franco was pointing out, we do have a referendum coming. That was one of the recommendations. It was also a campaign promise, and uh, it is. I feel as well, I've said it a couple of times, important. It's all steps, guys. I know there's people say, we want out of confederation right now. Well, fine, but there's not enough Albertans who want out. So go through these steps. Go through them. Show the futility, if it turns out to be such, of trying through these means first. And I, I assure you, every time one of these things tries and fails, you're going to get more of those people who said, okay, that's enough. It's, it's time to, to change the entire national agreement. Um, and constitutional reform is virtually impossible without tearing out first. So maybe it's time to start working towards that. I think it was time to start working towards that. Well, a long time ago. That's part of why I started the Alberta Independence Party when I was 29. Uh, and it's none of the issues have changed. That's some of the frustration. You know, I, I think I mentioned that in the show the other day too. And I, I was reading an older book and saw polling on Albertans' thoughts from back in the 70s. And the issues were just the same then as they are today. And nothing seems to improve. And but we've got to try different things. So we haven't had an equalization referendum yet. Uh, putting that power into voters' hands, that's something I want people to get used to. You know, get out there, get on voting with these things. Let's uh, push that envelope. Uh, is the Albertans saying the RCMP isn't accountable to local populations? You know, there's one of the aspects in the RCMP uh, reform that I would like to see. Again, with these officers, they get transferred. You know, they train and then they get shipped off to a different region of the country where they aren't locally entrenched. They don't know the local issues. They don't know the local players or individuals. And they've got to figure it out when they get there. I mean, community policing means being a part of the community. I, and you know what, just to point out though, there is a, a thing, a reason that they do that to a degree. Uh, police corruption, of course, around the world historically, and that's, it has happened and it does happen. If you've come from outside into a new region, your chances of having local criminal connections or things like that or opportunities for corruption are reduced. That is a part of the rationale for shifting officers around the way they do. But at the same time, it leaves somebody a little more uh, blind to the local uh, challenges and needs of the area that they've gone into that uh, may not have applied where they were trained and, and uh, where it began. So again, I, I personally, uh, I'll just go to what I'd like to see as, as far as, as long as we're in confederation, I think we should get rid of the RCMP as a contract provincially, get a provincial police force, but we do need to make sure we aren't, like I was talking about with the pension plan, not just making a carbon copy of the last force. So we're not improving anything aside from who's directing it. You know, let's, yeah, I hate to say, you know, study. I don't want to drag it on much farther, but we got to look at it. Can, how can we make it a bit better? How can we make it more responsive to people? Um, and how can we make it for better for the police? They've been getting crapped on all over the place too. They're, they're having a hard time. And there are some good officers among the RCMP, among uh, city police forces. I mean, that's not a fun or easy job. And, and it's stressing them out. And uh, that leads to some of the incidents and episodes as well. Forming a new force can really be an opportunity if we do it right. And the federal force, again, looking, say, like the American model, they'd still be there. But they would be there for issues that are federal in nature, you know, ones that are crossing the provinces, ones that are going national. So, I mean, it's not like they'd be gone altogether. And I think a lot of the officers, uh, if the contract was gone, uh, would uh, sign up to be on the provincial force. They wouldn't necessarily lose those those uh, individuals as it is. Um, pointing out that Kenny helped write the equalization formula. Yeah, uh, he's in a different role now. I mean, it's frustrating. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. Fair enough. But again, Kenny has nothing to do with how we will vote on that referendum. Vote on it. I mean, it's a separate issue. Don't tie this referendum, by the way, to your like or dislike of, of Premier Kenny or of the UCP. Just look at the referendum as an exercise in itself, you know, and, and vote based on that. Um, then we can start moving towards those changes. That's one of my fears. Okay, yeah, the UCP has been wildly unpopular, and I don't know if they're ever going to find their feet again. They're, they're in a lot of trouble in the polls. They're, they're sinking but don't let that apply to this referendum. You know, in refusing to participate in the referendum or, or voting a, a, you know, for equalization, it, it, it's not uh, the, uh, the most effective way to give the finger to uh, the provincial government if you don't like them. I mean, think of your own interests, think of the province's interests when you choose to participate in, the, in that referendum this fall. Set aside uh, what, what your thoughts might be on the provincial government with it. Uh, just uh, some... Nice words from uh, Teresa Shorty Bretz there. Love Franco is amazing common sense, which is an unheard of trait nowadays. Yeah, there's not nearly enough of it. Um, 
And yeah, he's not gone. He is heading though to Ottawa. He's going to, you know, he's the national director rather than the provincial one for uh, Alberta now. And uh, we're looking forward to see what he does there. Cause yeah, I mean, boy, he's going to have a lot more to dig into. Uh, you know, waste is bad enough provincially, but boy, that, that bloated monster in Ottawa is going to give him a lot of work to uh, carry on with over there. Um, yeah. And uh, Teresa also pointing out, yeah, the, the RCMP transfer every few, every so many years, they, they rarely stay in one spot. And again, I, I think that's that uh, it's mixed, you know, you reduce some, some local issues of having a long-term entrenched officer in an area for too long, but at the same time, they lose that connection with uh, uh, the, the local people. Uh, Spence, what do we got? Uh, that's what's going to happen. It's all going to be about Kenny's leadership. Perhaps, you know, I, I just rather we, we didn't let it become so. I mean, that's up to us. Uh, opponents to it are going to make it that way. Um, and then uh, back to the CPP, uh, Bonnie uh, has been speaking, saying what Canadians don't understand is it's not guaranteed, even though it's mandatory to pay into it. Uh, her husband paid every year for 41 years, passed away, and you get zero. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's not like your personal plan. It's not like if you didn't collect that you could leave it to your family. Um, yeah, he and his employer put 181000 into it in a real lifetime, and now she'll get zero because there's a maximum, uh, and she's already receiving the act maximum because she paid through her own work. Yeah, it's not a proper pension plan. It's, it's not a separate one. It, it's not independent. And uh, there are a lot of problems with it. So as Franco was saying, and you know, and that's another discussion that, that's worthwhile in, in having in this, is that uh, we don't want to bring out another bad plan. If we got the opportunity to bring in a new one, let's make a better one. And let's tie it to the person. If you're going to take that money out of my pocket every two weeks or whatever your pace period might be, it's my money. I should be seeing it. And, uh, you know, keep that independent. So we, we've got these opportunities. We've got these things to make change. When people want to see more uh, independence within the province, you know, within Canada, fine. Absolutely. Let's take on more and more. Let's just make sure we're not bringing on another version of what we just got out of. Because, you know, just a smaller version of the same thing is not an improvement. So I'm going to move on to the tail end of the show here. Uh, we've got a new addition at the Western Standard, and uh, it's a young lady named Jackie Conroy, and she's bringing some uh, much-needed energy and youthful vigor into a newsroom dominated by uh, grouchy old men, though a lot of people uh, do appreciate our, our crabby perspectives. It's good to get some balance, and Jackie has a, a story coming out, and she's been doing some work. So I'll bring her in there, and let's see how that's going. Hey, Jackie, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks, Corey. How are you? Oh, very good. Thanks. I see you're down in the office today with, with all the grumps. I'm hiding out somewhere else. Out at Calgary headquarters, just, just me and the grumps. <laughs> oh, yes. Very good. So uh, you, uh, well, a couple of things. I mean, you're developing, a, you know, bringing that youthful aspect uh, into our, our Krabby uh, publication. You've set up a TikTok account. I, I got to admit, I'm not a big TikTok follower and user, but it, it's certainly a large growing uh, social media platform for a, a lot of messaging. So wh what's up with that? I have to say, I was honestly in the same boat for a long time. I've always been kind of hesitant to hop on new technology, but I saw a lot of my friends kind of getting on it. And then when I was able to realize the actual business side of it, I found that TikTok can be really, really helpful for us. I think it's going to really help us be able to authentically engage with our audience, if that makes sense. Because as you previously said, every everyone knows us as like the grouchy old men and like we're very, you know, relevant and everything like that like it's it doesn't not to take away from anything like that but i think having that other side of things to kind of show our fun side and our energy and just kind of like what goes on behind the scenes to to show that they're not all just grumpy grumpy old men <laughs> well i am but uh yes yeah, so you can expose so, some of that and, it, and it's good so TikTok explaining a little bit how it is it's kind of a, a short form video platform so you can kind of take a bite of something and get a, a piece of it. And I guess that could potentially bring in new audiences. I mean, it's quite a commitment, say, to come into my show or Nathan's show because these are long two-hour running shows and it might uh, uh, be a little uh, dry. You might pick the wrong show the wrong day, but uh, be missing out on what could be a good production. TikTok, I guess, can kind of give you a little bit of a taste of something and maybe you want to see more later. 
Oh, exactly. And I think we talked about this before, but I'm really hoping to kind of supplement our personal TikTok account with like clip it's from your show, clip it's from Nathan's show, kind of like those really snappy little headline little pieces. And instead, because like you said, as, as amazing as the show is, some people don't have the two hours to kind of tune in for the entire thing. So I feel like TikTok can really help us engage with our audience in that way so that they can get those snappy headlines, even if they don't necessarily have time to sit through the whole conversation. Um, and you're hitting the nail on the head. TikTok is basically a short video format. Um, usually it ranges from kind of five seconds, 15 seconds, and like absolute maximum 60 seconds. So really short, snappy, getting your message out there really quick. Um, and like I said, I think that'll really, really help us because I think for the longest time, Western Standard has really been focused on, on what we should be as a newspaper, which is our news stories and everything like that. But I think as we're beginning to grow, having that TikTok account to, like I said, engage authentically with our audience, show them that we're not just you know, some hoity-toity thing in a big fancy office sort of thing that we're, we're real people. We like to have fun, all of that jazz. Yeah, I try and humanize it a little bit from, you know, that unsmiling guy who's just sitting there with the uh, green screen behind him all the time. And and it's, it's part of uh, what's been going on too. We are upping our, our, uh, our technical game uh, in the digital realm there. You know, we've been at it a few months and we're getting there. Uh, but as you can see from the shine on my forehead and, and the other things that... Uh, uh, we, we are actually getting some new gear and we're going to be changing our, our uh, digital content a little bit, uh, a little more recorded stuff, a little shorter form interviews, because we got some great guests and we get some great content. And uh, TikTok, I guess I'll give a good means and, and way to pull uh, those new uh, listeners and viewers in. That that's kind of been my entire thing with TikTok is reaching out to that Gen Z audience that kind of doesn't doesn't have quite the same grasp on on news as kind of someone that your guys's age would be and kind of needs that extra push to even kind of like get into it because i'm the first one to admit people my age are very very apathetic about about politics about kind of what's going on like so many people my age turn on cnn and see what's going on in america and then say oh no like i'm informed like i know what's going on and it's like okay well do you do you know anything about our for our current prime minister do you know what he's doing like oh no no idea like what is snc lavalin so I, I think it could really provide a nice little pipeline to get a younger generation into our stories, into connecting with us as a paper and kind of, like I said, bridging bridging that gap between Gen Z and, and what we have to offer as a news outlet. Well, great. So getting back to what our basis is and the stories and that, you've got a, a new article uh, coming out quite quickly with the Western Standard, I believe, on uh, women's uh, self-defense and such. I do. I it's actually I, I Dave makes fun of me all the time. I, I tend to be a little bit long winded in my responses. So it's actually being turned into two separate um, articles slash segments kind of thing. The first of which I'm really, really hoping will be up by the end of the day today. Um, basically just goes through because I'm not sure if you heard, but it was kind of a very large social media campaign that began around November of 2020. So like late last year that drew attention to the fact that within Calgary, within Edmonton and other places within Alberta, there have been a rise in attacks specifically targeted against women. And they, they, they've they kind of come in all different forms. Like some women are saying they're being followed without consent. Some women are saying that people are coming and taking photos without their consent. And like, there, there's definitely more extreme cases of like actual physical or sexual assault. But I was just really, surprised when I first started researching this how little media coverage it's gotten and to be totally fair I understand I understand where they're coming from I understand where a lot of people are coming from in terms of not wanting to cover it because there hasn't there hasn't been a lot of official news around it if that makes sense there hasn't been a lot of official police statements a lot of like official things coming out it's been a lot of statements because to be totally frank I think an issue that's been long in our history is coming up again now. People are afraid to go to the police. People are afraid. I had one person that I interviewed say something to the extent of, I was afraid to go to the police because I thought that they would try to minimize my issue. And like, because I didn't actually get hit, like I was afraid to go to the police because I thought that they would kind of dismiss me. So I think definitely raising the awareness around that is something that I've really been focused on for this article. And it's it's been it, it's been fun in a way, but it's definitely been a rabbit hole to go down and kind of see the the dark underbelly of what really has been going on within our city and our province. And and not to say kind of like as an overarching thing that Alberta is a dangerous place or Calgary or anything, but I think 
not enough attention is being drawn to this specific issue. And I think because of that, it's been getting worse. Like I just saw recently the police released a statement just this week about something that happened on Monday, June 14th, um, a man riding on a bike, going around sexually harassing women, grabbing them sexually inappropriately. Um, so it's, it's obvious that this issue hasn't died down. It's not it, it's not going anywhere until someone tries to do something about it. And so I'm I'm only one human being, I'm only an intern, but I'm really, really hoping that with my story, I can help bring some awareness to this. I can help kind of spread some people's stories because some of the people that I've interviewed have had really, really interesting, really scary experiences that I believe are worth sharing. And once again, I just, I believe that the more light that we can shed on this, the easier reaching a solution will be. Yeah, well, and, and you'd looked into some of the more self-defense aspects of it, you know, and that's something that gets overlooked. It used to be much bigger, and, and that's in a, a much bigger uh, story. The police do not like people taking care of themselves. That that culture that has come about, I mean, I, this going back to guests I interviewed recently and, and things with uh, 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 the uh, incident with, why am I forgetting his name? I know him so well. Eddie Maurice, when he dared to defend his household and his child and the police uh, ran him through the ringer. It's it's a real attitude. You know, I remember it was big as when I was a child, you know, even in the 70s and into the 80s with women's self-defense courses. Because unfortunately, perverts and, and molesters have always been a reality in life. Thankfully, they're a minority, but they're a very dangerous one. And it was common for, for women to go to these things to learn at least the bare basics so that hopefully if they're calling the police, it's uh, to report, yeah, I gouged a pervert's eye out and this is who to look for rather than saying, I have been assaulted and, and we now need to chase this person down. We've moved away from that proactive, take care of yourself first and then call the police thing. So, so you took a, a course or took part in something like that? I did. And, and first of all, Corey, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that there has been not necessarily a campaign, but definitely a culture from the police being promoted to say exactly what you said, that like people people don't really have the right to defend themselves. Like it's illegal to carry most self-defense weapons in Canada. It's illegal to carry pepper spray. It's illegal to carry a knife, a gun, anything like that. And I think self-defense courses is one of the only things that women or or anyone really have at their disposal to protect themselves because as you said like it's not it's not right like it's not like kind of having these self-defense courses excuses all of these horrible actions because it completely doesn't but i believe that you know in situations where police may not be able to help may not be able to get to you in time all of that stuff it's better to have something in your arsenal than waiting to call the cops and say this already happened. I believe that self-defense courses can really, really help in terms of being a proactive thing to do um, to really help people feel safer. And because that's the other thing, even if you don't actually have to use it, having those skills and having those muscle memories kind of like in your roster is really going to help you feel more confident, feel more safe when you do go out. Um, so I had an amazing opportunity to take a self-defense course with a woman named Diana who runs Satori Wellness Studio. And I, I will go into my article next week, but she actually started offering these free self-defense courses for any woman that wanted them ever since the attack started. And they've been extremely popular. She was saying that usually she would do one every few months, but ever since she's been doing like ones multiple times a month. So I think people people in the community have definitely really responded to it. And once again, I think if we can shed some light on some of these resources that people can access, like I said, not even necessarily in order to actually physically protect themselves, but just to give them peace of mind, just to give them something to say, you know, if this horrible thing ever were to happen to me, I would know what to do. I wouldn't be helpless. I, I wouldn't, th there's a lesser chance of me coming into harm from it. Yeah, well, and one of the things I know, I mean, unfortunately the downtown is, is is really in a decline right now. There's a big problem down there and there's a lot of very uh, unsavory people all over the place. One thing I, I mean, I get uncomfortable down there as a full grown, moderately healthy man, uh, you know, as a person who would be smaller and, and less able to necessarily defend themselves. Unfortunately, pet predators can smell weakness. They, they really can. And, and uh, one of the best ways to uh, dissuade them is just to confidently hold your head high. I mean, these guys are usually cowards if they are, uh, uh, you know, if, if they're facing somebody who, who looks a little more confident, I mean, preventative is always the best uh, outcome if we can with things and if we can avoid these. So I'm glad to see that discussion starting to come forth more though on, on a proactive level rather than always reactive when it's after the fact. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to, 
to see people harmed. Well, and that's the thing, other than Diana's classes, I haven't seen a lot of media coverage or coverage in general of proactive responses. It's always consistently been, you know, this happened and it's awful, but there's nothing that can be done about it because it's already happened. I think if we can grow that awareness campaign, we can stop things from happening and kind of contribute to that proactive action again. Well, that's great. I'm looking forward to seeing both your stories dropped. You, you got some video while you were doing that course and, and such as well, didn't you? Or I did, actually. I did an entire video segment. I myself actually went to um, Diana's studio to take a self-defense class of my own because, I, as, as is probably evidently obvious, this story was kind of very close to my heart. I have been fortunate enough not to have experienced one of these attacks myself, but as a 22-year-old female who lives in Calgary, who works downtown, like, I, I really resonate with what you said. Like, I... I feel I said, said to Dave the other day, I felt very naive because this is the first time I've actually worked in downtown Calgary. And I I definitely didn't expect things to be as bad as they are, if that makes sense. Like there's there's a lot of unsavory characters that are kind of frequenting that area that once again I didn't realize. So I once again, like as as much as it hits close to home, I'm very, very excited to share this story, share my segment, and hopefully people can see how amazing the self-defense class is and go and take one for themselves. Well, that's great. And, and uh, yeah, another thing to point out, I mean, downtown is where we're seeing it most evidently, but this, uh, you know, can happen and does happen everywhere. Uh, to date myself, for some people who might remember a long time ago, I believe it was the early 90s, but there's a, an area called Hemlock Crescent up in the southwest, and there was a, a serial rapist on the move up there for some period of time who did, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, assault a number of women. And, you know, it was at that time a whole lot of self-defense courses suddenly came about, but that's getting back to where it's reactive. You know, uh, if you can just get a little more of that uh, ability, hopefully, you know, early, we can avoid it being something after the fact. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the articles coming out in the video and uh, other endeavors as you uh, carry on your, your uh, summer downtown with the Western Standard Grouches. That sounds wonderful. I'm really, really excited to be here. And like you said, I'm excited to pump a little bit of youth and energy into this place. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today. And I'm certain we will talk again later. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey. Bye. Bye. So yeah, something a little uh, different there, you know, but I mean, it, it's interesting. And uh, the addition of Jackie, the addition of another point of view on, on issues, I think is going to be better for the standard and stories and things that uh, come out in general. Uh, you know, uh, Dave Naylor or uh, Derek or myself weren't really ever probably going to get a story idea popping into our head on how young women are, are dealing with the uh, increase of crime and odious characters in downtown Calgary. Um, now somebody else is bringing that point of view in there and uh, we'll have some great content to look forward to and, and discuss as we go forward. I mean, the, the, the crime levels in Alberta and in Calgary in general are, are a huge problem. I mean, this is a one preventative proactive area we can work in uh, on, on a larger issue. There's a story, if you go to the standard online, uh, and have a look at it from Rocky mountain house, there was a fella who had been arrested for stealing cars. Uh, they of course, made him sign off and promise, you know, for the short term before I go to court again, I won't steal cars and I won't do other things. They said, okay, fine, here you go, go home. Well, 10 minutes later, he stole another truck and smashed it through a dealership and allegedly did $200,000 damage. We've got some very serious criminal justice issues we got to work on, uh, you know, with these repeat offenders, these, uh, you know, short sentences for, for the dangerous ones and things like that. And then uh, getting back to with the discussion of uh, police uh, culture, RCMP, provincial police, things like that. We've got a whole lot of reform to work on. And uh, we're going to keep reporting on it and working on these things. But in the short term, I, I, I can't think of, uh, as Pamela's pointing out, teach your daughters to be independent and walk with confidence. And that's truth. Like I said, when your head is held high, the cowards tend to leave you alone. They, 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 these guys are, are chickens. They don't want to actually put themselves at risk. They're predators. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't just put on that air of self-confidence if you don't have something to back it up. So if a, a, a woman or pretty much anybody, actually, you know, men can learn self-defense as well, of course, too. Uh, if you've got at least that little bit of confidence to, to hold your head up, chances are you might you're, you're greatly reduce your chances that you'll ever actually have to use it. So, uh, yeah, that, that's something to look forward to. So that's about it for the show today. I do want to go through again our, our sponsors and, and again thank your subscribers. You know, it keeps us going, keeps us independent. 
uh, getting those voices out there, getting those stories out there, local content, uh, good content, stuff that the mainstream's just not covering. You know, things like, again, self-defense. The police and the court systems don't want us to defend ourselves. And uh, the media does what they're told for the most part. Uh, we, we won't. So uh, we discuss things like that. Now, the CCFR, they have been our sponsor for quite some time. You know, they've been bringing these digital shows to us. And uh, don't forget, you know, nobody's working harder for your gun owners than the Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights. They're Right now, they're suing the federal government on behalf of gun owners. Like, they're, they're taking the court. They're using the system. And, uh, you know, they're standing up for you. So, I mean, if you want to become a member and donate to their legal fund or see what they're doing and, you know, see why they should be supported, go to firearmrights.ca and click that Why Join. It'll give you all the information on why you should join them, why you should help them, why they will support you. So again, our sponsor there, the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. And when you're done with that, get over to the Resistance Coffee Company site. These guys are resistancecoffee.com. Uh, they are standing up for you in a different way in the, in the sense of um, donating a portion of their money to things like the Justice Center for uh, Constitutional Freedoms. But those guys have been standing up for you know people who've been charged under the uh, COVID restrictions and things such as that. They're giving 10% of all your purchases to organizations that are fighting for the constitutional freedoms of Canadians. Not only that, they're going to sell you good coffee. I mean, this is all a win. You're going to buy your coffee somewhere. Get it from Resistance Coffee Company. Get it from roasters that are in Western Canada. Visit resistancecoffee.com. Use the promo code Western Standard, all one word, and you're going to get 10% off that first order. They deliver it to your house. That's what's in these days. Order online, get it delivered, grind it up. Use some of those creative ones, liberal tears. You know, it might sound gross, but it probably tastes fantastic. My order is coming in right away. Uh, defund the CBC or uh, Empty Promises is their uh, decaf. If you follow on Facebook, they got all sorts of great memes that they're having fun with things on what are still very serious issues and uh you know be sure to visit them show their support so thank all you guys for uh joining me today we'll be back on monday and uh discussing more i'm certain there'll be more news more to discuss and uh well have a good weekend guys thanks <laughs>